Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and glad you could come here on the first rain of June, I think, um, uh, for uh, what I hope will be a fascinating evening entitled Slavery, Legacies and Remembrance. Um, I'm Mark Horton from the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology, um, and I'm here just to introduce our chair and our panel. I'm going to hand over to a chair of Arthur Torrington in a minute. Arthur has very kindly agreed to chair this um, event. Arthur is the um, secretary of two organizations, the Windrush Society and the Equiano Society, um, both of which are involved in commemoration in one way or the other um, of slavery and its subsequent legacies. And we're very pleased Arthur's come up from, from London to be with us. And then if I may, as it were, take us in order, that this is the secret order in how we're going to speak. Um, Ros, Ros Martin is probably well known to many Bristolian as an artist and playwright, um, and who has um, written and acted and written plays and so forth about Bristol and um, its activities and multi-ethnic aspects of the society here. And then Cameron Munro is a visiting professor at uh, the university who comes from the University of Santa Cruz, California, and has worked extensively on the archaeology of West Africa, um, places like Abomi, who I'm sure he'll be telling us about, um, and has a, a sort of a uniquely Af West African perspective um, on um, the Atlantic slave trade. Maz Dresser, I'm sure, is well known to all of you. Um, Professor Maz Dresser from the University of the West Indies, West, West Indies, <laughs> West of England, um, um, who is really the Bristol's leading historian of the 18th century, who has written extensive books and articles on the subject. And um, Koja Guava, who is the Associate Professor of Heritage and Archaeology from the University of Ghana in Legon, who I've known for many years and um, works extensively on historical archaeology and history of Ghana, um, ultimately known as the Gold Coast many years ago, and of course is often the focus of a lot of the heritage discussion about the transatlantic slavery. So a quick run round of who we are. So may I initially pass over to Arthur? <laughs> The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. I am very privileged to be here with you um, to discuss um, and to share information. Now, we don't have all the information, uh, obviously, and I'm sure you have got uh, ideas that uh, we could learn from. Now, um, I'm involved with two organizations. Uh, one is called Windrush Foundation. Um, it's to do with the ship. Um, that came from the Caribbean in 1948. It landed in Tilbury. Um, the men and women had served um, in the, the Second World War, um, and some of them were coming back to help to rebuild Britain. Uh, so it's about Windrush. It's about um, the Windrush men and women uh, helping to build a multicultural Britain, and, and so on. Uh, I'm also involved in the Equiano Society, uh, Oluda Equiano was um, of Igbo uh, heritage. He was an enslaved African at about 12, 13. Um, he was kidnapped, taken to Barbados. Uh, then he was taken to, to Virginia. And then he was sold again and, and brought to England. He also served um, as a powder monkey um, in the Royal Navy as a young man. Um, but eventually, after the Seven Year War, um, he was able. Uh, well, in fact, he was, he was resold into slavery, and he spent four years uh, in Montserrat. Um, he was sold for 40 pounds, and eventually Equiano bought his freedom for 40 pounds. And in those days, 40 pounds uh, is about three years of money. Um, so he was able to save that money, um, that 40 pounds. And in fact, he was also able to um, have a party afterwards as well having got his freedom. So he was able to save, let's say, about 60 pounds or whatever in those days. Now, the, the topic um, has a word that I'd like to uh, add to. I'd like to add the word abolition. And I hope you don't mind to the, to the topic today. Um, in the sense that we often forget abolition when we're discussing enslavement. 
abolition itself um, has its own story. And uh, not long ago, in fact, um, just last week, and I'd, I'd like, can you um, pan these out for me? Um, when, when just, I don't think I have enough, but what, what it's, if you can just, just pass it around, uh, just half it in the cup, just pass it around. What it is, <clears throat> it's about an exhibition called Making Freedom. Making Freedom is about commemorating 175 years after full emancipation in the Caribbean. Many of you might not realize that in 1838, Britain um, allowed nearly a million Africans um, to go free, to, to be freed in the Caribbean. Now, they ought to have been freed fully in 1834, but somehow uh, Britain unfortunately played a trick uh, on the ancestors and brought in something called apprenticeship. And that in itself was a form of enslavement in 1834. But the people who live in, um, in Antigua, they were freed and given uh, full freedom on the 1st uh, of, of August uh, 1834. People who were in Canada got their freedom on the 1st of August 1834. The people in the Cape of Good Hope, that's South Africa. There, 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 was, there, 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 was, there was enslavement in South Africa. And they got their freedom as well in 1834. And people in Mauritius. There was slavery in Mauritius as well, and they got their freedom in, in 1834. So our project really is, is saying that Africans did something for themselves in the leading up to emancipation. They weren't just given freedom because, you know, the queen was uh, sorry for them. It was a case of Africans being agency in their own emancipation. Now, I tell you uh, why that, that is so. We've done some studies to show that the Haitian Revolution, 1791, and then the Declaration of, of Independence or a Republic in 1804, generated enough impetus from the enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. It was an impetus. Now, I passed around some, um, some, some leaflets to show you uh, and those of you who are able to get copies, um, to give you an idea that the 1st of August 1838 was an important day in the Caribbean and that Africans, um, many of them walked away from the plantations. And that's why eventually um, a lot of people from Asia, uh, you had Chinese um, going to the Caribbean, you've got Portuguese, you've got obviously South Asians. What people don't realize as well, that indentureship also included Africans. Africans were indentured. In fact, I'm told that one of my you know, uncles from the past was from, uh, from, from Lagos. And one of my cousins uh, have, have a copy um, of, of his uh, birth certificate, which meant that indentureship also included African people. Um, we are told that possibly 50,000 Africans were indentured, whereas up until um, 19, I think 1970, 1919, there were about half a million uh, Asian people who were indentured in the Caribbean. So what I'm trying to say is this. When we are actually looking at enslavement and memory, we need to consider that Africans, for example, in, in, 18, in 1816, there was a rebellion in Barbados. You had Bussa. He thought that he could... Uh, gather together men and women who would fight against the British. Well, you can't fight against the British, you know, with, with knives and forks and, and spoons. You have to have guns. And he, what, what he didn't have was guns. Uh, enough guns to fight the British in the Barbados, 1816. And then in 1823, in Demerara, that's Guyana, another um, person by the name of, of, uh, of um, uh, Comina, and another uh, relative of his uh, by the name of Jack Gladstone. Now, by the way, Jack Gladstone um, was an enslaved African in the plantation of Sir John Gladstone, whose son, William Gladstone, was the Prime Minister of, uh, of Britain. So these guys were all involved in enslaving African people in the Caribbean, especially um, this uh, Sir John Gladstone. Um, there is a project in London to do with uh, compensation and he got something like 110,000 pounds. Now today, that's 110 million. 
That's what um, Gladstone uh, got. And in fact, you know, we had this exhibition that, that I've passed around to you, which was in the House of the Parliament last week. And uh, we invited David Cameron, we invited Nick Clegg, and well, in fact, even before, you know, uh, we had the exhibition in the House of Parliament, um, this Making Freedom, we had the exhibition in the Marcus Garvey Library in London and then the, the RGS um, in, uh, in Kensington. And we invited them and they were too busy to attend. So we brought the exhibition into the house. And uh, it was not that far away and they couldn't make it, they, they told us. So in terms of memory, what, what, what we have actually realized is that this thing about enslavement and abolition, uh, there is a particular memory gap in the minds uh, of, of, of certain people at the very top. Even now, I had a letter from uh, a secretary of, I believe it's the um, foreign, foreign minister, foreign, foreign secretary, just about two days ago, uh, saying to me, we asked them for um, uh, a quote from the prime minister. Uh, can I can I detail what I really want from the Prime Minister? So I had to say to the Prime Minister that um, we're not asking for him uh, for a quote about slavery, a quote about abolition. And I think that is the actual thing that uh, we, we, need to, we need to say. Because abolition, just to summarize and uh, get going uh, to the other panelists, is that Africans eventually in, uh, in Jamaica, uh, Sam Sharp was a, a Baptist deacon, and he organized something like 60,000 African men and women in Jamaica who realized that, that they're, they're impatient about slavery. Whereas in 1823, William Wilberforce and um, Buxton, uh, they were talking about what is called gradual emancipation. That was a discussion, right? But there's a lady by the name of Elizabeth Herrick, who from, from Leicestershire, she said, no, we disagree with Wilberforce. The Africans must have immediate emancipation. And whereas Wilberforce didn't want the women to get involved in the abolition movement, they formed their own movement, the women. And in that sense, they were able to campaign on immediate emancipation. And then, six, seven years after, Sam Sharp and 60,000 Africans in, in a, uh, in, in Jamaica, especially in the, um, the western part of Jamaica, St. James, they decided that, look, this particular thing to do with emancipation is getting, uh, it's too long-winded, it's, it's not going to come. And they decided to rebel. And, well, again, they didn't have enough weapons, but at least they, they were able to, well, to fight their way through. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, to burn a lot of vill uh, villages and, um, and plantations to the tune of one million pounds. Now, today it's one billion, right? And that particular rebellion and all the murders and the killings and the fighting among the people in um, the western part of Jamaica forced the parliament force Parliament to decide that emancipation would be immediate. We have documents to show that that's exactly what happened in, in the select committees that they had. They decided that if Africans were not given their freedom now, they would burn the whole of Jamaica down. And in that particular sense, and of course lives will be lost, both white and black and who will be lost. Like in Haiti, Haiti had a particular rebellion, a particular revolution, lots of killing, and they felt that that shouldn't happen in Jamaica. And that forced Parliament to grant emancipation. And therefore we look at slavery and emancipation in a similar way. Well, thank, thank you, you Arthur. <laughs> this is a, a very historic moment actually that we're here in the uh, Wills Memorial Hall, the Great Hall of Bristol University, because I think that in the 20 years that I've certainly worked for Bristol University, and there may be some memories that even go further back than mine, uh, the issues of slavery has not really been properly discussed or debated within the university. Um, we are a very proud institution here with wonderful buildings, uh, buildings that was funded um, in essence originally with money 
from tobacco. Tobacco is one of the plantation crops that came as a result of slavery. Um, we have behind us the coat of arms of the University of Bristol, which on the left-hand quarter um, has a dolphin. Um, dolphin, of course, was the coat of arms of Edward Colston, about which there has been a mighty amount of controversy in recent weeks. Um, one of the, as it were, fathers of Bristol, but also somebody who was a, a member, um, a director of the Royal African Company, um, and who many would see as one of the main villains in the history of of Bristol slave trade. So it is a, a major moment here that we're all gathered to discuss and debate legacies and remembrance. And I suppose the key element of what we're to be discussing is this idea of remembrance, that we don't really want to apologize, we don't want to um, um, try and right the wrongs of the past, but we need to understand the past, to understand its heritage in order to make the world a better place. And I hope that what I have to say and what others have to say is part of that, that broad message. Uh, Bristol as a city has had a long period of ambivalence about its relationship with slavery. I can remember taking a student group round um, slave-related sites in the city and somebody came, popped out from an alleyway and said, why do you keep on going on about the slave trade? Um, after all, it only lasted 100 years and Bristol's trade was 1,000 years. Why do you go and talk about the, the wine trade or the cloth trade or whatever? But actually, that 100 years, or just over 100 years, um, was a really important point in the city's history. It, it cemented its prosperity, it w contributed to the architecture of the city in many, many ways, and really the fabric of the city goes back to that great period of the 18th century, and I'm sure that Madge will be telling us more about it. So we walk around wherever we see as part of the legacies of the slave trade, and that's something that we, we really need to, to understand. And from time to time, there have been moments in the city's history in which that period of denial has, has been moved forward to let's try and embrace that past. Um, with the anniversary of the discovery of North America by Cabot in 1498, there was a lot of controversy in the city then um, with the um, Festival of the Sea that something should be done, um, that this white... Um, um, a triumphalist history of the discovery of the new world needs to be counterbalanced with its legacy. Um, and that then followed a very successful exhibition in the museum, um, which was, I think, at the time, the most popular exhibition. And the naming of, of Perrault's Bridge that was kind of happened, great ceremony, but then was quietly forgotten about. Um, I think there was one plaque somewhere in the city um, that actually commemorates um, the the, the the, the activities of Bristol merchants in the slave trade um, high up on the side of what's now the M Shed, what was the Industrial Museum when, when that was uncovered. So if you are visitors of Bristol, you would really not understand or to be able to appreciate that, that legacy, that heritage. And you would be thought to maybe this is a city that is in denial. I don't think we are in denial, uh, but I think we need to do much more about it. Um, and I think that in Bristol we're in a unique position to understand that slavery was not just the horrors of the Middle Passage, uh, but it was the whole system. It was a system that used both the um, development of industrial infrastructure in the Bristol region, whether it was the brass and copper industries, whether it was the coal industries, whether it was gunpowder, whether it was armaments, um, at one end, um, or whether it was the processing of the, the sugar and tobacco um, on the other. Um, there were something like 20 sugar refineries here in Bristol, and that, that those, those that essentially they were plantation products. But also the ownership of all those um, plantations by many Bristol merchants is all part of that. And the money that they received in compensation um, at abolition or at, at emancipation um, in the 1830s that then fed through to a lot of the building of the Victorian infrastructure that we see in the city today. So there is a lot here, but that wider story, I think, is a story that needs to be told 
and understood. And I don't think posturing about renaming the Colston Hall or whatever necessarily helps. What we really need to do is we need to educate and tell that whole story. Um, and I'm reminded of the fact that Bristol is to become the European green capital of Europe um, in 2015. Um, and perhaps there is a story to be had because being a green capital is all about sustainability. Um, and slavery is not about sustainability. It is exactly the opposite. It's about the gross exploitation of human capital in an extremely wasteful way. And it's kind of ironic that a city that's going to become the green capital has its origin in the, the horrors of the Atlantic slave trade and the plantation economy. And I think it would be wonderful that the city would wake up to this basic contradiction and somehow can expedite its past by creating education facilities, a major memorial in some way, a, a memory place, as, as Kojo explained um, to me last night when we were discussing this, a place of memory, a place where that memory could be um, discussed and people could understand, we could use it for art, we can use it. The word museum is not quite right. Um, but in some way, we need to have something which is a physical memorial to this extraordinary history. Um, and I think that if something comes out of this evening, I hope that that idea might actually carry weight, move forward. Thank you. Um, now, can I ask uh, uh, Professor uh, Mads Dresser to... Oh, right. okay. yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me, uh, and thank you for attending. Um, well, <clears throat> I was just at the British Museum the other day uh, at the Viking exhibition, and of course the Vikings uh, slave traded in Bristol in uh, the year 1000, so it's not completely irrelevant, but what struck me um, is that um, in one of the cases they had a, a medal of the great Norse god Odin, and on his shoulder were two ravens, Thumen and Mumen, the ravens of history and memory. So you have history on one side of the shoulder and memory on the other. And I thought that's a, a, a rather telling metaphor because uh, memory, uh, the, the, the uh, um, raven who uh, was uh, symbolizing memory, uh, his, uh, it comes from a Norse word which either means memory or desire. And I think history and memory are two different things. Um, and if we take a sort of ranky and old-fashioned view that history is what happened in the past, and I know that's contested, but for the purposes uh, for tonight, let's just say that what, what we can document and understand actually occurred, uh, as opposed to what we choose to remember, I think that we're um, getting into the territory about what sort of legacy we want to establish or what sort of uh, history, uh, uh, um, official history and civic commemoration we want to establish for this city. And who's the we? Who is the we that has a collective memory of our city's history? I think the public has changed over the period and it's riven, it's not a monolithic um, uh, 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 public, it's riven by class, race, gender divisions. And the uh, history of uh, slavery in this city has often been contested. When I first came here in the 70s, um, uh, I was um, absolutely astonished at the fact that people would use the term darky um, is a, 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 a casual term of, of talking about uh, black people. It, it's something that was in the 19th century in, in, in the Civil War in America, and that no one, a lot of people did not want to talk about slavery. And I feel somewhat responsible uh, for the, um, the current controversy over Colston because when I uh, worked with, um, for, on the first slavery exhibition in 1990, Eight, um, I did a, an outreach um, uh, exercise in St. Paul's and talked about the research I'd done that really clinched the uh, involvement of um, Colston in the Royal African Company. This was something that a, had been you know, in the academic literature uh, in the 1920s, but pretty much uh, ignored and certainly denied by Bristol's establishment. Well, the next day after this public meeting, a, um, the Colston statue was then daubed in red with F. Hoff, slave trader. And it just shows you the volatility and the, the fact that you know, history isn't just an academic subject. It actually means something about the way we articulate the kind of present in which we want to live. 
And so with that comes responsibility, because um, what kind of uh, history do you want to convey? It will, the kind of uh, accuracy and the good research that you put into uh, the history will inform and determine the quality of the kind of commemoration you have. And I think it's really important that we embrace the contradictory aspects of our history. The fact, for example, that Colston was a, a director of the Royal African Company, did trade in slave-produced sugar, did um, co-invest in um, the sugar refinery, which is where St. Peter's Church is. Uh, but he also was uh, a philanthropist of a very selective kind. You had to be Church of England and a Tory to get the fruits of his charity. Uh, but uh, he was a, um, uh, uh, he helped uh, renovate the city. And so as such is celebrated uncritically by another section of establishment society. And um, we have to look at those uh, uh, connections and embrace the contradictions because there are, uh, we are a contradictory, you know, as human beings, uh, we are contradictory. And I think it's really interesting to ask, how could somebody uh, who had all these charitable and religious impulses also justify the enslavement of other human beings and not to silence one aspect of their existence at the expense of the other. Uh, and so I, um, although I can see the justice of renaming Colston Hall because it is a music venue. Uh, I, I am very uh, uneasy about airbrushing, airbrushing the Colston's name or getting rid of the statue uh, of, of Colston because that erases the history so that when people come, they may have a corporate bland notion of the history and perhaps a nod in the direction that, oh yes, it was a slave trading port. But they won't see the, um, uh, you know, the layers upon layers of the influence of the slave trade uh, on the city's history. So somehow we have to negotiate a way that doesn't um, uh, do a, a disservice or doesn't denigrate uh, the uh, fact that our public now is comprised of a lot of different people, including the descendants of enslaved Africans, and we must uh, not honor someone who has exploited them. On the other hand, we must not erase uh, the, the historical nuances and contradictions from our collective memory. And so I, I feel quite strongly about that. Now, I think there's some really interesting uh, um, responses that you get about the legacy of slavery because many uh, people either uh, with regard to the Colston debate or the statue or what have you, um, uh, many uh, mainly white working class people uh, and middle class people are saying is, oh well slavery was a long time ago, get over it. In fact, that was the very word of someone who emailed me congratulating me on my uh, position of my debate which made me think, oh dear, that wasn't quite the response uh, I had wanted to elicit. And um, in response to that kind of um, a statement, um, I would say that um, the legacy of slavery is a lot more long standing and long lasting than a lot of people, particularly white people, realize. There's a legacy of economic underdevelopment uh, that um, was uh, encapsulated in a 1938 report about Jamaica Ro Royal Commission. Uh, there was a lot of labor unrest in Jamaica just before the first generation, the Windrush generation, came out to uh, Britain. And one of the things that they found, in fact, they had to suppress the Royal Commission findings till after the war, it was so explosive, was that the agricultural workers in 1938 uh, were earning the same in real terms as those agricultural workers who had just been emancipated in 1838. Okay, so really there, people haven't moved on in terms of earning power since slavery. There was very little infrastructure in terms of roads, industrial development, schools, and certainly no colleges uh, in the 19, late 1930s. That's the generation that came over. So there's a continuing legacy of underdevelopment. We could also ask about the kind of warlord culture that the slave trade helped to foment and strengthen West Africa, whether that has a legacy about governance in this city as well. Uh, sorry, uh, governance in, in, in Africa as well. And also is at the root, perhaps, with colonialization that followed uh, slavery uh, uh, that helped to determine the kind of population which has a growing West African presence in, in this city and in Britain as a whole. Uh, there's a psychological um, legacy, which I think many white people are insensitive to, of, of not knowing your identity, of the trauma of slavery, uh, of not being able to trace your ancestors uh, beyond enslavement, which leaves a lot of people a bit rootless and not knowing where they sort of fit in uh, uh, to sort of the, the cosmos in which they inhabit. And I think that hurt and that trauma needs to be properly honored. I also think that um, it's, it, Political correctness does have its uh, you know, uh, uh, faults because um, if you simply try to enforce 
um, a uh, politically correct um, a view on, on the city's history without taking people along through education. Uh, you can um, cause white resentment, and we've seen that with the UKIP uh, reaction, uh, where uh, particularly working class people feel their exploitation hasn't been recognized, that, uh, that middle class museum curators feel from London feel much more comfortable dealing with uh, ethnic issues than class issues. Um, and I think that um, although uh, white working class exploitation is very different in terms of brutalization and intensity than enslavement, it still needs to be recognized in this city. And I think the work of the Bristol Radical History Group has done some great stuff on that. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm probably running out of time, so I'll, I'll leave it with that, but I hope I've uh, given you a bit of food for thought. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I now introduce um, Professor um, Cameron Munro? Well, thank you all for, for coming tonight, and thank you for including me, and Arthur, thank you for agreeing, agreeing to chair this session. Um, today we are all here trying to think constructively about Bristol's role in the transatlantic slave trade and how best to discuss that history. These are all obviously issues that go well beyond Bristol. They encapsulate cities and communities all around the Atlantic world. My own experience as an archaeologist, I think, lends a slightly different perspective um, to some of the folks talking tonight. And I'm going to talk a bit from my experience as one working on the archaeology of um, West African kingdoms who were involved in the slave trade. I've been asked to talk a bit about the history of West Africa's involvement in the slave trade tonight to give some broader context to what we're all talking about. And again, I have to forgive you. I'm not a, a historian of Bristol. I'm not even a historian of Great Britain. So what I have to say comes from a, a much different perspective. I know nothing about the Colston debate, for example. So I'm uh, learning quite a bit as I, as I sit here listening to this tonight. Something I'd like to do before, before launching into just a bit of the history of the slave trade in West Africa is pull out some key ideas that I think shape most discussions about how we talk about slavery and the slave trade, whether it's here or in the United States or even in West Africa. And Madge pointed to some of these issues a moment ago. And these, these relate to the notions of history and heritage, two very fraught and complicated ideas. They're at the very heart of what it is that we're talking about today. When we talk about history and we talk about heritage, I think we're actually conflating very complex, multifaceted notions. When we talk about history, for example, most of us refer to history as the past, the study of the past. Right? For me, where I come from, the past is a huge, unbounded period of time. The past is everything that happened before now. History is a disciplinary practice that picks and chooses what it is about the past we are going to talk about as a, as a civilization. Right? And history is shaped the way we do history, the way we present history. It's shaped by a whole number of different issues. The kinds of archives we have, what's preserved, where it's preserved, who has access to it. Um, that could be documentary archives or archaeological archives. You know, what's out there to look at. But it also involves a lot of choice. It involves a lot of choice about what we agree on as good history, what makes acceptable history to write about. From an archaeological perspective, my, my field of, of expertise, the same thing can be said about heritage. Heritage is to culture what history is to past. Human culture is all that complex suite of ideas, values, likes, dislikes, ways of making a living in the world. Right? Heritage are the things we pick and choose from our culture, from our shared suite of cultural traits to present as the best of who we are. Right? So whether it's an institution like the British Museum or the Smithsonian on my home turf, right? these institutions, these museums are organized to catalog, to describe, and to present the best of who we are as a civilization. Um, so history and heritage essentially what we're talking about tonight, the history and heritage of slavery, these are intertwined in a very complex political project, one designed to tell a certain history and ignore other histories. The late, historian, the late uh, Haitian historian and anthropologist, um, Michel Rolf Triot, once argued that the process of writing histories is as much about silencing and forgetting 
as it is about giving voice to and memorializing the people of the past. And I think that's exactly what we're talking about today. Tonight, we're, we're cutting across the grain of traditional history and heritage studies to seek ways of talking about the heritage of slavery, an institution that many would choose to forget. Okay. So most of us have some semblance of how the transatlantic slave trade was organized. Um, just very briefly, this is a public audience, so we can talk in very loose terms, right? Um, the period that we're talking about from the 16th through the 19th century, the, the Atlantic era, or the period of the triangular trade, we're talking about an era when manufacturers produced right around the corner, right? Right up the road from where we're sitting tonight, were shipped to West Africa, used to purchase human beings who were sent to the Caribbean, or to plantations in the American South, or to Latin America, to work to produce raw materials, which were then shipped back to Europe to produce those same manufacturers. So it was a global trade that involved communities all, on every corner of the Atlantic world, Europe, North America, the Caribbean, South America, and Western Africa. This is a global trade that started in the 16th century, but really peaked in the 17th century, when the plantation economies of the New World really took off to produce tobacco, sugar, indigo, cotton, other products, which were again brought back to Europe to satisfy an insatiable demand for these sorts of products. This trade that we're talking about tonight resulted in, in our current historic, our conservative estimates now, resulted in the forced migration of 12 and a half million people. Right? Now that's our conservative estimate. That's our best guess right now. Undoubtedly, it was much higher. Undoubtedly, millions of more people died en route to coastal ports. And of course, millions of people who got on those slave ships never got off, not to mention the horrors of slavery and slave life once they arrived in the New World. Now, the effects of this massive movement of people to the, to, uh, from West Africa to the New World, the long-term demographic effects of this mass migration are, are undeniable. Um, one of the things that historians and anthropologists and archaeologists, all of us studying West Africa, have asked for quite some time is given the long-term debilitating effects of the slave trade on West African societies, why in fact did some African groups engage in the slave trade? It's been a legitimate conundrum that many of us have sought to work out. The obvious answer, of course, is that many of the goods that were produced in places like Bristol, Liverpool, elsewhere, were in hot demand in sub-Saharan Africa. And we're only now beginning to tease out exactly what role those goods played in West African society. We used to think that they were flooding across the continent, displacing local industries. We know that's not the case anymore. Some of these goods, such as guns, gunpowder, were clearly implicated in the military conflicts used to capture slaves for the export trade. Um, other goods, such as brass goods produced right here, or beads, or alcoholic, distilled alcoholic beverages, these were used as currencies, so they fit right into local e economies. Other goods played more symbolic roles, things like textiles, pottery, other manufacturers, were in hot demand by an emerging elite class, merchants and uh, kings of West Africa, and they used them to show off their status in very traditional ways. So one of the things that I think is interesting to highlight about the way in which production here articulated with the slave trading economies of West Africa in the 17th and 18th centuries is that you have analogous things going on, just as the grand Georgian manors of Bristol are getting thrown up by wealthy uh, merchants and plantation owners. You have elites in West Africa building royal palaces, right? establishing new urban communities. And so interesting analogous things are happening on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm not gonna go on too much more about, about this. I think some of the, the issues will come out um, in the discussion, but one of the things that we've tended to focus on historically is that Europe and Africa were involved in some sort of complex trading relationship. I think one of the things we can all collectively agree upon now is that we've ignored the role of class and that it was really rich, wealthy Europeans and rich, wealthy Africans that were coordinating in the most despicable trade in human history. 
And so we can't forget that. There are just as many Colston types in West Africa as there were in Western Europe. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Todd. Thank um, thanks very much, Professor Munro. Uh, and now we'll have Professor Kodjo. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, when we talk about the enslavement of people and the trade in, uh, in human beings, uh, the focus has been on chattel slavery, that is the uh, purchase of human beings, transformation of human beings into cargo and their shipment into um, Europe uh, and the Americas. Um, but there's also more to the enslavement of people in Africa. We had domestic situation whereby people were absorbed into families, people were acquired and absorbed into families to strengthen the family or to provide labor. Uh, that can be categorized as a domestic slavery. In that regard, people still, had, people still had their persons, they had their personality, they were still human. But when chattel slavery came in, that, uh, the difference is that people were dehumanized, they lost their dignity because they were transformed into commodities that were exported. And in that regard, you had merchants on both sides, as we just heard, merchants in Europe, merchants in the Americas, dealing with their counterparts on the African continent. Today, as we remember the trade, uh, there are so many ways of doing it. In Africa, we have, uh, in Ghana, our research suggests that many communities um, use folklore as one of the ways in which they remember uh, slavery, especially domestic slavery, um, songs, even in names. We have people who are named slaves. In my language, clue means slave. Uh, in other languages, they call them donko, which refers to slaves. Um, slavery generally in, in our communities, especially domestic slavery, there's a whole lot of silence over it and uh, it is a taboo in some communities to even ask people of their background. Uh, not that it is not known, it is known, but people would rather keep quiet over it and, and move on, uh, rather than confronting each other um, about the issue. Now, with regard to chattel slavery, memorialization of that aspect of slavery um, was not um, something which was publicly done in my country in particular until sometime in the mid 80s and the early 90s when UNESCO and other international agencies sought to commodify um, the mobilization of slavery as part of the, enterprise, the tourism enterprise. Uh, we had UNESCO and other foreign missions uh, supporting the refurbishment and uh, conservation of some of the forts and castles that uh, served as facilities for promoting the export of human beings. In Ghana, for example, we've had Cape Coast Castle and Elmina Castles. Now, the point about it is that these facilities are targeted at a particular category of people coming into Ghana. Um, and some of us are worried about that in the sense that we are attempting to commodify something without giving people the opportunity to clearly understand what has happened. We also have communities that are raising statues uh, of um, uh, people who they lay claim to, uh, for example, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Uh, we have statues of those people in some communities and uh, people would, would invent stories about those communities being the origins of these people in order to make money. We have those who perpetrated, uh, perpetrated slavery in, in our communities actually playing victims uh, to what happened in the past. Um, that goes on, but the important thing for us in research today in Ghana is that we, we are moving gradually away from the orthodox facilities that uh, memorialize slavery, the forts and castles, to identifying other features like landscape, mountain settlements which served as a refuge for people fleeing slavery, the resilience of people, uh, caves and rock shelters where people sought refuge. We also have sacred groves 
some of which served in the past as uh, market centers where uh, people were traded. Um, but the bottom line is why do we have to confront this issue in spite of the silence? One key factor is that the interaction between Africans and Europeans, which resulted in the trade and dehumanization of people, has led or has engendered a shared heritage. We cannot separate heritage in Africa from European or Western European heritage because much as Afri Africans have appropriated certain aspects of European behavior, values, uh, material objects, Europeans have also benefited a lot from their interaction with Africans. If for nothing, the labor provided um, the impetus for them to generate income that was used to build many of the cities to lay the foundation for industry. So there's that element of shared heritage. But a key, another key factor is that it is costing the world more than necessary to ignore the discussion on slavery or to gloss over it because of the economic imbalances that have been created as a result of this unfair dealings in the past. Africa has been impoverished. There's a, this economic imbalance in Africa today, and um, some have labeled Africa amounts uh, communities, so we call them third world countries. Why do we have such a connotation? It's presumed that yes, our economic situation is bad. Technology transfer is not available. All this stemmed from the long period of deprivation. And as a result, many Africans out of hardship would migrate, whether we have immigration laws in the United Kingdom today that is targeted against foreigners. People would find ways and means of coming into Europe. And it's still serving some economic factors, some economic uh, um, gains in, in, in this part of the world. People would come in. Also, another reason is that on the continent, because of the situation of people raiding groups of people sponsored to raid other communities for human cargo, we have latent resentment which has uh, engendered conflict situations across Africa. And when there's conflict in Africa, everybody contributes being taxpayers. The taxpayer money is spent in addressing such conflict situations in Africa. And it doesn't augur well for the world at large. We need to realize that it is about time we considered each other as human. And as we heard earlier, uh, slavery was between affluent businessmen and women in Europe and in Africa. And we can lump everybody in Europe in the same category. Everybody in Europe cannot be blamed for what happened during those years. The same way everybody in Africa cannot be blamed. But what do we need to do today? What we need to do today is to look for it. We've come a very long way. And the more we confronted this situation, the better it will be for us to be at peace. But if we should gloss over it, wash it under the, or hide it under the carpet, the latency of the sentiments people have, the stereotypes will be perpetuated and that will not help anybody. So uh, what one wants to leave with you this afternoon is that yes, we've had a very solid history, but we need to confront it in the sense that those agencies that promoted the trade are powerful and they are still in charge of the global economic and political situation today. There is no need for us to, to perpetuate supremacist ideas because that is one of the major legacies of the trade in enslaved people, that one category of human beings, Europeans, are considered to be superior to another category of human beings, Africans, especially those of color. And that should not continue because it's negatively affecting our interpersonal relationships and the way we deal with each other. We are, our neighbor, we are keepers of our neighbors. 
we need to work together, and we have been working together for a very long time, although the nature of the work has been negative to some extent. There is a need for us to overcome our differences, confront the issue, plan together, and build a better world for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, our final, our final speaker is uh, Ross Martin. So, listen to her. Oh. I've done a tribute. Um, I'm going to just do them to some music by Polly Bolton and then speak for a couple of words at the end. Are we ready? I am a living ghost, but I am a human being. You don't know me. You may never know me. Where do I begin? I feel my heart beating. What do I say? This is where I begin. I tell you, I am here. I'm always here. Joan Smith, being a blackamoor, buried St. Philip's and Jacob's, 1603. Judith, Negro woman, aged about 50 years, Baptize St. Mary's Redcliffe, Mary Smith, a black woman, aged 30 years, baptized St. Paul's, 1911, 1798, Ellen and William Craft, 1850, running a thousand miles to freedom, Georgia, Boston, Liverpool, Bristol, Sanctuary. Black child. How did you get here? How long does one stay before you're buried, forgotten? What happens to you? Bassett leg, buried St. Michael's, First of the first, 1753. Of course it's not your name. None of these are any of our names. You shrink, become invisible. Maybe we cause it to ourselves. Blame us now. Strangers to ourselves in our own history. In the silence, the unsaid, no, I will not be. I come from Lagos, Salvador, Lagos, London, South End on one side, the other, I do not know. Bridgetown, Castries, London, Africa, UK, the Caribbean, South America. This Atlantic Triangle is me. Begs now, I've settled here, Bristol. We visit Atlantic histories, the receptacle of all our dreams, our hopes, for good, the greed of hearts, the ocean is where unrested spirits lie, trades ply, goods, people, always we sail in our imaginings of new life. My family are seas dispersed, Montreal, Bristol, London, Tampa, Salvador, New York, Castries, Port of Spain, 
bridge town. We have spread our wings, settle as Castries farmers, acquire land. One, two, three, four generations of dressmakers. We are printer, painter, shopkeepers, from enslaved workers. I remember for you, for all of us, the cultivation of European empires, colonial projects of the Portuguese, British, French. I come from forced laborers in Brazilian plantations, Sarah's returnees, a Victorian Lagosian elite privileged in British colonial administration Lagos, slavers imprisoned. I come from weariness, weariness, a Lagosian people involved, evolved, chief iman, philanthropist, builders of a school, British colonial subjects, loyal servitude, your great war firemen, fueling British Empire's conquest when under German threat. I come from a wrestler, snake charmer, teacher, nurse, cleaners, actors, military, and UN personnel. I come from unfulfilled dreams. I remember sculpture, lawyers, Arabic scholars, a people of commerce, travelers, engineers, entrepreneurs, union and civil rights activism, a Muslim and Anglican union. I come from all variations of the human condition. It's opportune greed, generosity, a history of globalization's complexities. Its reverberations is both you and me. I want to thank you for inviting me here to speak today. I'll speak not representing anyone but myself. Who am I? Who are we all in this place? Beautiful, isn't it, at this time? Thank you, African ancestors. As I said, the piece of music is called Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a very generous contribution by a fellow artist in Shropshire, Polly Bolton. The two pieces I composed for this evening are Ghost of Our Ancestors and Remembering Where I Come From. Us here now, in union with Af African ancestors' silence, the legacies are all our concern. There are many of us, like me, African diaspora artists, musicians, writers, painters, sculptors, whose work engages with the very quest of who am I, historically now. It is a quest for all of us in remembrance, how we relate to one another, how much racism permeates still our daily lives, what it is our own privilege means in respect to others. And what has it been like living in Bristol? This is my home city, working and raising children for 20 years. Often I'd say it's quite like a Houdini-like struggle to get out of boxes with labels. An otherness, when you sense that otherness is always wanting. But we survive like the dandelion persists, resistant, seeking cracks and crevices to flourish. I am inspired and uplifted by ancestor struggles. The Caribbean slave rebellions that were mentioned, the reset the timetable for abolition, the Mali revolts, I'm keen to learn more of my Brazilian ancestry, the struggle for decolonization in the Caribbean, the dear late Richard Hart charts in his books, the struggle of Caribbean arrivals in the early 60s, Bristol bus boycott, 
led by Paul Stevenson, Roy Hackett, Guy Bailey, and supported by the university here. And now, how far have we got? To the recent case of David McLeod to overlook for job promotion, ably able to work in an inner city academy school with a 70% black and ethnic minority. He represented himself at tribunal. No legal aid, no more. The horrific death of an Iranian refugee here in Bristol, Bijan Ibrahimi, at the hand of his white neighbours. Racism is alive and well. Creative imagination is my domain. Let it be all ours. What I'd like to see in Bristol? A monument representing past and continuous struggles in the skyline of African ancestors. An additional plaque for the Colston statue. And I feel very strongly as an artist, um, the Colston name taken out of the music hall. We did talk about a memory center, Kojo, and I kind of think that be quite innovative and way of looking to seek to dig dignify, learn and heal through memory's journeys, all of ours. Let's honor Bristol's African ancestors and the diaspora contribution past and present to this city in whatever way we can for all our tomorrows. Thank you.